Hello once again and welcome to another edition of Beverly's Times Past. My name's Ed Josephs and today our guest once again is Mr. Richard W. Sims from North Beverly and the author of the uh, terrific book, North Beverly Remembered. Hi, Dick, and welcome to Beverly's Times Past. Hi, Ted. Nice to be back. In our last program, uh, Dick, we were uh, talking about some of the uh, old-time transportation vehicles and we uh, uh, got up into North Beverly and we discussed some of the uh, wonderful collection of pictures that uh, 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 Mr. Kenneth Hay had sent down to you into the uh, society, old time cars and whatnot. And we had some tra some trains and uh, a couple of airplanes uh, thrown in there. But we finally ended up with uh, a couple of scenes of trolley uh, cars down at Ellis Square in Beverly. So we thought at that point that we would come into our next program, which is the one we're doing now showing uh, the more or less the history of the trolley system here in this part of our North Shore. That's right, Ted. Uh, most people today don't realize uh, how thoroughly connected the local towns were by street railways. And of course, that started with horse cars initially. And then after the 1890s, when electric motors were perfected, uh, they were converted to electricity. So they became the trolley cars uh, of legend. Uh -huh. Now, back before the days of trolley cars, how would people get around, Rich? What was the mode of transportation? Well, of course, early on you had stagecoaches and uh, omnibuses, that sort of thing, uh, which would only hold, you know, half a dozen or eight people. So when you traveled, you traveled uh, perhaps not too far a distance? That's and, correct, uh, or certainly not overnight. Uh, they would stay at, at uh, inns and that sort of thing overnight if you had to go from here to New York, say. Uh, probably involved a couple of nights on the road somewhere at an inn. But a trip, let's say, from here to Boston was quite an undertaking. Oh, it would have been. And of course, the railroad made it a lot more convenient, but uh, the trains uh, didn't go through every town. They had a specific route. And uh, unless you were going between here and, and Boston through uh, Salem, Swampscott, Lynn, and Chelsea, that was it. Um, you know, you had to go to local towns, and that either meant getting on a horse or hooking up your wagon. Mm -hmm. And so the street railways were born. Now, when, approximately when did the trolley system come into being? The horse railways uh, came in around the time of the Civil War, the initial uh, horse railroads. And that involved laying tracks, rather crude tracks, in the dirt roads and having four-wheeled um, cars running on, on railroad-type wheels hauled by a couple of horses. And those were called street railways. Now, uh, was this, uh, did, did this idea generate from the, uh, from the newly invented railroad? Uh, I think it did, yeah. I think the tracks obviously were much smoother than running wheels on, on the dirt roads of those days. Uh, iron rails, even though it would be considered rough riding today probably, was a lot smoother than, than riding in a wagon over rutted dirt roads back in, in those days. I see. So that really the two of them ran parallel to In one many another. cases, that's correct. What, was there a rivalry, do you think, between the two? I don't think there was because even in the days of the Civil War, a locomotive could easily make 40 or 50 miles an hour, and a horse can certainly you know, not go that fast yeah. uh, with, a, with a heavy load behind it, certainly yeah. not. So they more or less coexisted uh, one uh, sort of yeah. Yeah, uh, the, enhancing the other. Right. The, the horse railroads, the street railways were basically a complement providing local service, you know, almost door to door uh, for people living, you know, in town as opposed to long distance service which the railroad, the steam railroads provided. I see. 
So uh, now we're going to start here in a minute showing some pictures of the earliest uh, cars that we have in, mm -hmm. in, in the collection. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the Walker collection we're referring to. Yes, and that's a, at the Beverly Historical Society and Museum, and uh, it's a collection that we've had there since 1969. And there's about uh, 30,000 photographs pertaining to New England transportation. And the street railways are a big part of that picture. Okay, now again, the, the collection itself was donated to the Society? It was indeed, yes. It was donated by uh, a person named Lawrence Breed Walker. And he was from Salem and uh, had been doing this as a lifelong hobby. And upon his death, uh, he had willed this collection to the Beverly Historical Society. And since then, it's been enlarged upon uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, we mentioned a network. Now, uh, could you briefly describe what that might consist of? A, a, a local trolley network, let's say. Yes. You would get, let's say you wanted to go to Lynn. Mm -hmm. How would that occur, let's say, if you were here in Beverly, what would you do? Well, if you were in Beverly, we'll say you're at Ellis Square in Beverly. You simply got on a car at Ellis Square, which took you to Salem. And then from Salem, you changed cars and took a car to Lynn. Hmm. And uh, that probably involved a journey that took maybe an hour or more, but, you know, it was a, it was a stop at every corner type system. Yeah. And so you just had to know what car to get off, to transfer mm -hmm. to, to the next car, and you could practically go anywhere in, the, in this entire area. Oh, yeah, and, and even further area. than that, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could take a trip uh, a long distance by streetcars. I remember hearing my father tell that he had gone from Beverly all the way to Ellsworth, Maine at one point, just traveling on streetcars, and the furthest he had to walk was about a half a mile where two lines didn't quite connect. I see. And you could come from the Middle West. I know someone had made a trip from Michigan to New England just on streetcars. That's how extensive the connecting networks were at one time. Isn't that something? And we're going to show later on in the program some maps that mm -hmm. will pinpoint the various locations that one could travel uh, from practically any point uh, here, here in, this, in this New England area. That's right. Uh, which, which is, uh, today of course we have none of that. We, we rely mostly on our, on our automobile uh, transportation, which is uh, kind of getting a little bit, uh, shall we say, hazardous. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, so maybe maybe it might have been a good idea had we kept the system going a little bit. You know, the only remnants of it, of course, are the, are the few buses which still run down the streets today. Yeah, and those are, of course, with the big T on them. Right, say. Those right. Those are the, the last of the... That's the last of what began as, as horse cars. Yeah. Is now these buses we see today. Yeah. Now, this all kind of peaked around the early 1920s. Would That's you say? correct. The, the networking system of the trolley uh, cars. And from that point on, things kind of uh, degenerated and uh, to the point here in Beverly, I believe the last trolley car ran through in 1937. Seven, that's correct, February 28th. And we have pictures of that. We've already shown one mm -hmm. of them or a couple of them in the mm -hmm. previous program. But uh, it, it didn't take very long once the network had reached its, its, uh, its zenith uh, to, for it to dismantle itself. And what was the reason for this, Rich? Well, coinciding with the peak of, of the street railways was the popularity of the automobile. Uh, just as the street railways reached their, their zenith right after World War I, so at that time did the production of uh, Model T Fords reach its, its peak. And uh, they were affordable. People could buy them. Uh, the roads were getting better. Some were paved at that point. Quite a few were paved and it made it much easier to come and go whatever time you wanted to and not have to wait for something that was on a schedule. Uh -huh. And that's what did it in eventually was the automobile. Yeah. And the few of the people that rode the lines, the trolley lines and, and so forth, why the more serious the condition became. In that's terms correct. Of the, of the, it was a snowball effect actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get going right now then mm -hmm. with some of our pictures and uh, we have quite a few of them uh, this evening to show our audience. Uh, do you want to Take the first one here. We have, I see, a, a, a trolley car over the Beverly Salem Bridge in 1880, Rich. Right, and this, we've started with this picture because even though it's not the earliest one we have here tonight, it typifies uh, one of the early horse cars coming across the Salem Beverly Bridge. And uh, you can see the schooners tied up in the background, and there's a little bit of Goat Hill shows up there in the background. Uh, we're looking from the Salem side back toward Beverly, obviously. And uh, it's a pretty good view of, of one of these early horse cars, uh, which would have been on the Nomkeg Street Railway, which was the local horse railroad. That was the, the local mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
company here That's in this, these parts. Mm -hmm. And the track obviously ran uh, from Beverly to Salem on the right-hand side of as, the, of the as bridge. We're looking, yep. mm -hmm. As we're looking at it. And uh, were these open cars? These were open cars. In the winter, they had closed cars. And um, they, no matter whether they were open or closed, they were still pretty drafty and cold in the winter because even with a coal stove, you were hot right next to it and you were cold two feet away from it. Uh -huh. And of course, along uh, w with these horse cars, they had to have accommodations, as we'll see later on, uh, for the horses, for the animals and, and the cars. And so there mm -hmm. were various uh, car barns and horse barns. And That's so right, forth. stables and, and car barns. Yep. That were located along the route mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the system here. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's uh, something, uh, well, well, we'll talk about the mileage a little later on. I believe there's a 17, when they got electrified, there was a 17-mile route of uh, travel uh, and the power all generated from, from the Essex uh, uh, station, I believe mm -hmm. it was. They had substations which generated power for the trolleys when they were electrified. Yeah, but this would come along later. That's right. In 1880, we're still uh, into the horse trolley. Still with uh, Old Dobbin. That's right. Old Dobbin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next picture. Okay. Here we have a picture which comes to us not from the Walker collection. This is from the Wenham Historical Society, and it's one of the fabulous photos of uh, Benjamin Conant which uh, you've had in some of your other programs. Mm -hmm. And we're indebted to Wenham uh, Historical S Association and Museum for several of these pictures and uh, through the, the facilities of Mr. Harold Boothroyd. But this one shows, again, a typical horse car of the, of the 1880s period. And this one is at Depot Square in South Hamilton. And uh, it's just a really nice side view showing the two horses, the conductor, the driver, he wasn't a motorman then because they didn't have motors yet, so he was the driver. And several passengers who were sitting on this open car, uh, and you can see the, the bad weather curtains rolled up there under the, under the side of the roof in uh -huh. case it rained. You could let those down. Yeah. And it's just a great slice of life picture of a typical uh, horse car of those days. Yeah, Mr. John Caves, I believe, is the driver here, according to mm -hmm. the note, and a Mr. Hooper, uh, the conductor. That's Conant, correct. Mm -hmm. A Conant uh, picture. And the, and the name of the company was the Nom Keg Street, Street Railway. Railway. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, horse car company here in, in, these, in these parts. Now, would they change the type of car in the wintertime? Would they have the... Yeah, they would have a closed car in the wintertime with, again, an open vestibule, so the, the driver still had to stand out there in the snow and ice. Yep. But the passengers were somewhat protected by being inside, and, and if they were really lucky, the stove might be going. Yeah. But even if it was, again, you'd, you'd boil next to it and freeze two feet away from yeah, it. Yeah. Well, next, we're back in Beverly Ridge. Mm-hmm. And here we have a horse car seen at some distance uh, rounding a corner on Cabot Street, supposedly just above Ellis Square, but we're not entirely sure of that, but it certainly looks uh, like it possibly could be. And uh, it's in the uh, late 1870s. And you really can't see the horse because as this was taken with a very slow uh, glass plate camera, the horse is obviously moving, the car is coming toward us, and the horse is blurred enough that you can hardly see him. Uh -huh. uh, whereas you can see the front of the car fairly clearly. Yeah. We were talking that this possibly might be just a little above St. Mary's Church. That's what we think it is, yeah. Where the curve in the road That's uh, correct. Bends, around uh, the, slightly around to the, the left there. Mm -hmm. yeah, look at those uh, trees that uh, once stood on Cabot Street, Rich. A mm -hmm. lot, lot different today. Sure. Well, the, of course, they were elm trees, and, and they all went out in the, in the 1930s from the Dutch elm blight. Yeah. And of course, most of those houses today, if in fact this is where we think the mm -hmm. picture mm -hmm. should be, uh, most of the houses are no longer there. Correct. Cabot Street in the 1870s. Correct. Next, we'll move back uh, to Wenham, and this is dated May 20th, 1896. Mm -hmm. And this is another uh, Conant photograph, which originated with the Wenham Historical Association and Museum and has found its way to the Walker Collection, but we thank Wenham Museum for it. Uh, this actually shows the conversion of the rail uh, from the lightweight iron rail for the horse cars into the much heavier steel rail uh, for the coming electric cars, which were much heavier. And uh, this was done all over the system. And uh, here we see them right at the bottom of Pond Hill on what is now Route 1A, uh, which makes that S-curve up the hill around that uh, cove of Wenham Lake yep. that comes in there. Yep. 
Now, why, uh, I think you've explained this, but why again would they have to revamp the track because of the weight, the of, weight the of the car? Because the horse cars essentially were nothing but a wagon with four, you know, steel railroad type wheels, whereas the trolleys, the electric trolley cars, uh, were double truck cars usually, uh -huh. and you had the heavy electric motors and everything with their, their magnets and all that between the wheels right in the frame of the truck, and there was one of those uh, on each truck, yeah. and that was a lot of weight right there, yeah. plus the car weight was, was heavier being a bigger type of vehicle. Yeah. More sophisticated machinery mm -hmm, coming correct. into coming into being here. Now the track that's being covered up here, of course, is the spur track from the from the railroad uh, mm -hmm. uh, track. It would have been the what the eastern track. That was the thing? eastern track, which was of course just over beyond the hill at the left there, which uh, came from North Beverly and is heading up toward Hamilton and Wenham. Right. And this was a, an ice spur that which came across uh, uh, Enon Street and went into the old uh, Gage Ice Company. Uh, beyond the uh, the cove here on the lake, yeah. on this track that we see that's being 